Hi, I'm here with Stephen Collishaw. I'm very delighted to be here in London. Thank you for coming all the way down from Nottingham. Thank you. And uh, your book, A Child Called Happiness, just came out two weeks ago. That's correct. So could you tell us a little bit about the book? So the novel's set in Africa. It's uh, set in Zimbabwe. It's about a, a girl called Natalie who is English and she's obviously had some form of trauma in England, which is kind of unrevealed given that she goes to stay with her uncle on a farm in northern Zimbabwe. Um, and as she's living there, the, the farm uh, is, is this is set in 2011 uh, during the period when Mugabe is really pushing for the uh, farms to be um, nationalised and redistributed. And it's increasingly clear that the farm that she's on is, is going to be taken. And so there's the growing tension of, of what's actually going to happen. It's interesting because there's so much, you're very good at creating that sense of the multiple layers of the, of the, of the conflict and the difficulties. It's not just a straightforward, this farm should go back to who it used to belong to, the family it used to belong to years ago. You've also got the other thread of Mugabe actually wanting to give it to someone that's in his team, as it were. Um, and all of that sense of people's love and belonging to the land. This is a kind of big issue. <laughs> Um, and I've only read one other of your books, I'm keen to read more, uh, A Song of the Stork, and that also has a very complex theme, you know, it's set in uh, World War II and um, in Lithuania, which I know you have connections with, but I'm just, there's two kind of big times of conflict with these individual stories going on in the middle of them, and I wonder what draws you to writing about such huge topics, complex topics? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you could say that. Um, but I, I hope that the books don't read as being complex. I mean, no. my, my real desire in terms of that is is to to have very um, unadorned narratives, if you like. And I'm hoping the story works without being particularly complicated or, or complex. So though there may be issues behind it, I think, I, I, I hope that you can actually read the novel without actually having to hugely necessarily engage with some of the, the bigger stuff that goes behind I think it. that's very true yeah. of both of them, but yeah. I wonder what draws you to the kind of individual story within those times of yeah. difficulty. I think there are two things that I think I that wanted to deal with um, and that quite a lot of the novels deal with. Um, um, one of them is to do with the importance of place. And for me, place um, is incredibly important. And I think that that places have a, a resonance that is that that develops through history. So a place is a place is shaped by its history, and a place remains. Um, in, I, I like to think of it as in some ways as being haunted by its history. Now, what, what I loved about very, in terms of the books that I've written about Lithuania, it, I, it does feel very much for me when I go to a place like Vilnius that there is there is a culture that has gone, that has been removed, that is, that is still there in, in some kind of way. And that feels like a haunting. What was really interesting for me in terms of when I was writing about Zimbabwe, mm. which was kind of different from the Eastern European setting, was that the, the past didn't feel so much about a haunting. It felt very much about, about the fact that a spirit of a people remained within a place, which is very much a part of, of the culture of of Zimbabwe, that the ancestors continued to live, the spirits continued to inhabit the, the environment. So it didn't feel so much of, of a haunting of a place as a, a continued existence of a place. Yeah. But I think that places do have this enormous power, and I, and I wanted it very much to write about a place. I think my, my, my novels are very much about, novels about place as, as much as people. But in terms of conflict, what I really was interested in doing is looking at how ordinary people behave in very, very extraordinary times. Yeah. And how um, just very ordinary people deal with some of the huge conflicts that go on. So to look at conflicts, but from the point of view of just a, an every man yeah. and see what, what, the, the, what the effects of that and how a normal person goes through those times. I mean, I, I'm a historian. I mean, my degree was in history, history of okay. English. And so I come to it as a historical novelist yeah. and I love history and the exploration of history. Uh, but particularly looking at normal people living through those extraordinary times. That's a really good answer to my question. 
Um, and one of the other things I wanted to ask you about um, was, yeah, I mean, you, you find these people who are often very different to yourself and who come from very different cultures um, and in, in some senses are voices that we don't necessarily hear so much of. And how do you sort of go about that process? How do you go about becoming someone who isn't you or, or, being, or representing someone who's so different to yourself? For this particular novel, I worried much more about that than I had, I think, for previous novels. But I'll come back to that in a second yeah. in terms of the fact that I think that I, I, do, I am concerned about the nature of cultural appropriation yep. and how appropriate it is for me, particularly in terms of Zimbabwe and its, and its particularly troubled history and Britain's involvement in the suppression for so long of a particular people to then weigh into that, to talk about that history from, from my viewpoint. I, I can be concerned about how I would represent the, um, the non-English uh, element of that story. Having said that, I don't know why I don't worry about that in terms of Eastern European history, yeah. why I feel more comfortable yeah. taking on an Eastern European voice than I would of, so for instance, my first novel, I write very much as from the first person viewpoint of somebody who's lived through the Soviet period, a period of intense oppression of which I have absolutely no history and experience. Yes. And I'm not quite sure why I feel that those two different those two different narratives are so entirely different and why I feel more comfortable to fit into one than I would to another and I'm not sure that they, they should. But having said that, you know, obviously my last two novels have both been written to an extent from the viewpoint of a woman as opposed to yes. a man. Uh, yeah. And again, that's me stepping into a set of shoes that I never had to walk in at all. But for me, to an extent, writing is very much about an exploration. When I write, I write as an exploration and it's an exploration of place, it's an exploration of, of a particular time in history, and it's an exploration of how other people might behave or how other people might feel about those circumstances. So, yeah. you know, this is not, a novel is never something saying, this is what happened. A novel is a journey, a novel is an, an exploration, it's, it's a journey into something, a journey of discovery. For you as much as for the reader? Uh, very much for me as much yeah. as the reader. And re it's very much the case that the reader can come back and say, well, I disagree with that yes. representation. I don't see a novel as an end point. It's, yeah. it's a part of a discussion. It's In fact, you might be happy for someone to come back and say that, because as you say, it does start that conversation. Absolutely. I was very, you know, one of the loveliest readings I've ever done was um, from my first novel when I went to do a reading. Um, and my character is very conflicted in that first novel. Um, he does something that is, that is really not good. Uh, and afterwards there was two ladies talking about whether they felt this character was, was basically a good guy who had just been wrong or was basically just a bad guy. And I went to offer my opinion on the subject and they were not in the slightest bit interested <laughs> in what I had to say about the yeah, subject. Because they knew. Because it was their book. Yes. You know, once I've, once yeah. I've read, written that book, it be, and, and once it really comes to a book, and once it really comes to a book, it's their book. It's their book to read as they wish. It's their book to, to argue with, to enjoy. To, to talk about or, or so or so for example with a child called happiness which does discuss you know British colonialism to some extent how do you want your readers to go away what do you want them to kind of go away thinking about in a way at the end of that book do you think you want people to think about about who does how we yes who does who we how we've been involved. Uh, yeah, though I think it's you know I think it's more than simply about Zimbabwe because there, there yeah. are so many places in the world where land is contested, where we contest. You know, and how long does it take before? How long does it take when somebody occupies a land? When's that point come where we say it's their land and not the previous people who lived their land? And those those very complex emotional issues of who does land belong to? Because obviously there's, there are many places in the world today where people are struggling against each other because of their sense of who this land actually belongs to. Yeah. And it's an incredibly difficult topic to deal with. And I think we're very flippant in the way in which we, in which we act towards contemporary struggles. And I think we're very easy to come to quick judgments that this person is right and that person is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm not entirely sure that I think that any of those cases are, are clear-cut or easy. I think they're incredibly complex, emotional, 
emotionally um, freighted subjects that we have to approach with a degree of sensitivity. And I think, you know, if, if a childhood happiness is, is anything, I, don't, I hope there's not quick moral answers there. I, no, I think that's what I meant when I said that I felt it, it's complex, and I think because the issues are complex, and I think that's clear in the book. Um, I'm particularly interested at the moment in the fact that I feel as as a as a nation we haven't really dealt with colonialism, that we haven't really owned it and said, okay, this is what we did, we're sorry, we haven't done any of those things. And for me, I felt in a sense your novel was was part of that kind of narrative which is one of the reasons I think it is interesting to, to represent other voices, even if you can't necessarily, or it's, there's some anxiety around how authentic, which I don't really like that word, but how authentic it might mm. be. Mm. Um, so for me, it seems that it's a good thing to be part of that conversation. Do you feel that it is part I, of that? I think particularly at this moment in time, we have to be more and more having those conversations about our colonial past yeah. and the true nature of that colonial yeah. because I think we're at a, a rather dangerous position in this country where we might come to start um, re-representing that period in, in a way that is not accurate. I, and I think we're already thought. doing that, actually. Absolutely. I, I think, think we're already we doing that. Yeah. And I yeah. think it is really useful. I mean, for me, it's been very interesting. I mean, I, it, uh, in terms of his timing, um, I'm quite annoyed that Mr. Robert McGarvey was pushed out about six months before <laughs> my novel was actually uh, published. Uh, McGarvey was a really interesting figure for me because I actually I, I've never actually represented a real person in a novel before, but yeah. McGarvey appears in the novel, and I feel very very conflicted about the figure of him and how I would I, how I feel that what well, I feel of course is, is completely relevant, but how I feel about him as a as a person mm. because I mean I, w- I was watching a film just recently um, about the nineteen eighties and particularly about the music. Uh, in Zimbabwe in the 1980s uh, and there was a particular line in one song that was so resonant um, and the line was something along the lines that Mugabe suffered so that we could be happy um, and that sense in which uh, and I think you know we, we tend to see him as almost a monster figure and it, indeed the, the you know the way that he's driven the country uh, towards chaos over the last 20 years has been has been really problematic but as, as an English person to say that, I, it is very, very problematic because there is a man who really did put himself forward to fight against the injustices of first British and then uh, majority of white war who, who treated the native population with it in an absolutely appalling manner. Um, and he himself suffered hugely because of that and had, mm. and had a great dignity and a great uh, wit and a great... Uh, passion to to fight for the rights of his people and uh, I don't know where it's going with that but I think it's no, a fascinating well, figure. No one person is is one thing are they particularly in in such difficult complicated situations um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm glad that your your book does have him there <laughs> he's, a, well, he's a fascinating figure um one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was was symbolism, because particularly in the Song of the Stork, I felt that you, you really like things to symbol. I, I just wondered what attracts you to symbolism, what you what you feel it can do in a way that perhaps um, straightforward narrative can't do. This, it, uh, that's a really funny one actually, because uh, particularly when I was writing the my first novel, I, I remember speaking to a friend about it, and I was saying. I was trying to explain what I was doing in the novel, and I was saying, you know, I want to cut out all metaphor, I want to cut out all, you know, all that kind of um, sense of, of prettiness around the, the language and stuff like that. Uh, as I was describing to him, it, it to him, it became clear that everything I was doing was symbolic and metaphoric. Yes. And but I, I think what I was intending to, I really, in terms of the prose itself, I really dislike overly fine. And I really like, I, I feel like I'm trying to pare back the writing as much as I possibly can. So I don't think you get overly, um, overly uh, flowery 
uh, metaphoric language being used. But hopefully, I, I mean, the symbols are, 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 are there, but they, they are they are within they are within the um, the structure uh, and the background rather than, than in the actual writing itself. And, and, and do you think that's a place in which you can explore theme, for example? Yeah. yeah. So I think what it allows, because as I said, with the, in, in terms of um, you know, the, the history, I'd like it to be not complex, but I really would like my writing to be as simplistic as possible and it to be a good story. I need to be able to read it as a good story without being having any worry about what the complex issues might be or what the themes might be. Uh, and for the writing to be fairly simple and, and as clean as possibly can be. Um, but the idea that you can have layers, the idea that you can read to a deeper level, the idea that it can, can spark kind of ideas about bigger and different things, I think is, is important. But I don't think, I wouldn't want those to be foregrounded and possibly it's problematic if they feel as though they're foregrounded yeah. in the novel, as though those symbols are, are really important. I think it's important that they're there. But I don't think it's necessarily yeah. important. I just can see those them. rocks on top of each other, <laughs> with the light, the sunrise hitting the top. You, yeah, there's some um, those beautiful images that do, I think, stand out and say something wider about the book and the writing as a whole. Well, it's you know, I, I think you you can, should be able to enter a book on whatever level you want. To I enter a book, I would agree. You know, yeah, and and. I wouldn't want my books to feel as though they were shelf books in that sense. So I, I really, uh, I really like the idea of keeping things as pared down and as simple and as straightforward as possible. Uh, but that simple doesn't mean that it has to be um, um, that it has to be simple. Doesn't mean that it has to be basic. Yeah. You, know, you can have a richness in. Yes, simplicity, you can have a depth in simplicity. Which is yeah. hopefully what I was trying yeah. to move towards, and I think the symbology possibly allows you to have the depth without without the prose feeling like it's heavy and overweighted and over serious so that the, the, sim the symbology allows the depth to come without the prose style itself being over taking on overweighted that weight. Yeah. by by that kind of idea yeah that's really interesting so there's no philosophizing i think in the novel there's no moralizing in this novel there's no people talking about grand issues or grand themes in the novel so hopefully but they're very much there. That's what's interesting. That, well, that's, yeah. that's, I think, possibly what I was attempting to do, what I have been attempting to do in terms of the writing. And over a long period of time, you think you've been working yeah. towards that? Yeah. yeah. My, I mean, my first novel was, I mean, there, there was stuff that I put in the first novel that nobody's ever noticed, so why, why the hell is there? I'm, I'm going to have to read no it now. Idea. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, it's a triptych. It's a tri uh, my first idea was it was a triptych. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's framed around three stories which were framed around three ideas uh, of the resurrection crucifix, you know, like a, a, tri a triptych. Yep. Um, and each of them deals with some aspects of that. And then there's a whole theme, theme going through it of female suffering, the iconography, um, and the theatricality of male suffering and how male suffering is always up there in, in, in the eye while the female suffering is always stuffed down into the corner. And there's a whole theme about it that nobody's ever noticed this really pointless putting it in there but it amused me while we're I was all going to go and read it now and find <laughs> it um, um one of the other things i wanted to ask about was noir press which you yes. set up yeah. so can you tell us a bit about that well really what it comes down to is obviously i've been going to lithuania for 20 odd years and i'm a writer and one of the things that you do when you go to a country is you really want, want to, to read, read their work you want yeah. to read their work and i do speak lithuanian but when i read when i read in lithuania it's painfully slow process um, and I wanted to enjoy the writing so and particularly I wanted to enjoy contemporary writing you know the writers that are writing at this moment in yeah. time and it was impossible there was literally there was absolutely nothing of contemporary Lithuanian fiction printed in English at all um, and so really the basic idea behind it was to to try to do something about that to try to change that and to try, try to bring some of the most interesting and some of the best writers that are writing Lithuanian to an English readership at this moment in time. I mean, since I 
I started that up, there has been a few more books coming through, so it's actually yep. possible to get hold of a couple more books now. But you're really still talking about on two hands, as opposed it's to... It's amazing. I mean, I think translated fiction anyway. I mean, I don't know what I would do without it. Absolutely. I want to read as widely as possible, but I often find myself frustrated that by not being able to get hold of a book, or if a book, you know, ha it's you then can't get it anymore, it's gone out of print. It yeah. just seems a shame that we don't value... Translated so, fiction as much as we should, I think, in this country. So, as a part of the market, it currently, it currently occupies about 3% yep. of, of the fiction which we buy is translated fiction. But that 3% is mainly made up of Joe Nesbo and, yeah. and writers like Ellen Flanty and Joe Nesbo. Yeah. So, in actual fact, the width of translated fiction is much lower than 3%. So, yeah. it's a tiny amount of fiction being translated into some form in, uh, from, uh, into English from different countries. And it's only being a very tiny country, I mean, there are only mm. 3 million. Lithuanians um, and so there's not a huge amount of people who actually because one of the issues with translation is you should translate into your native language from your foreign language but there's not a huge amount of English people who speak, who speak Lithuanian. Lithuanian so the, you know there's a dearth of of people who are there to translate there are some great translators and we've been able to use some really lovely translators doing some great work um, we've got another one coming out next which I'm okay. really excited about it, it comes out of the uh, 1st of July and this guy called Yaroslavas Melnikas he's actually Ukrainian but he went to live in Lithuania uh, and started to write in Lithuania which is quite incredible yeah. he's won BBC Book of the Year a number of times he's won prizes in France um, done hugely well internationally never been published in English before wow. really excited to get his short stories and this is a real passion project. My wife, my wife is the Lithuanian literary editor, so she she recommends and, and works with which of the best books to come over. And she read this book of short stories and said we have to publish this because it's Brilliant. such interesting uh, um, philosophical stories. They read. You've got a beautiful, simple style, so they're very entertaining stories. But they're they're so off kilter. These stories mm. they really make you think about the world in a different way. So it's called um, the Last Day. July the first. I was going to ask you what book you might recommend to read that wasn't one that wasn't your own, but I'm guessing that's what you would recommend. <laughs> I would definitely recommend <laughs> Melnicus. So yeah, look up Melnicus. You can obviously buy it online or buy it straight from our website, Melnicus.co.uk. Uh, all three books or we, we brilliant. We distribute through all bookstores. I I will I will buy that. Excellent. Um, my last question really is what you're working on now. So what you're doing currently. Yeah. I am working on something, but I, I'm not going to talk about it, okay. simply because <laughs> I have this kind of writer superstition that uh, once I start talking about it, the, the energy will, will disappear from the project. Fair enough. Entirely. I know other people who are like that, so, yeah. For me, writing is like, for me, it's like a pressure cooker thing, you know? You have to kind of really build up that pressure, and when you've done it, when, when you build up enough pressure, it will, it will do the job it has to do. So if you keep taking the lid off, it's kind of not going to happen. How long does it normally take you then, do you think, it, to write I, a novel? I'm not a fast writer. I'm not a fast writer. Partially because I do lots of different things. I, I teach. I've got the press, which takes up a huge amount of time. And so it, it kind of comes in, in fits and starts. So it normally takes me about a year to a year and a half to... to I still consider that to be quite quick. Well, possibly. Yeah. You know, it took other people longer times, but possibly to write better novels. So... I'm not saying anything about that. <laughs> I think time doesn't necessarily make a better novel, I don't think. Not necessarily, not necessarily. But um, yeah, so I'm working on something for this one this time. So. Brilliant, but we'll, possibly that might be another Legend Press project? I, I really not? hope so. I've yeah. really loved working with Legend. Um, they are a fantastically dynamic press. They publish some really interesting writing and... A, you know, and they're they're really approachable, which has been nice as a writer to have a press that are are ready to talk to you yeah. about all aspects of, of the publication of the book. You feel you feel like you engage with the process of policy, rather than somebody's having stolen it from you and taken it and done something with you with it. With Legend Press, you feel like you're involved in the whole press, which is which is a really nice feeling as a writer. So, and they do a great job. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much My for talking to me today. Well. Everyone go out and buy uh, all of Stephen's books from the beginning all the way to Childhood Happiness. And um, I'll be back doing another interview uh, in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Love Thanks. It. Thank you.